Good morning, Washington Church. Wow, you guys are really awake this morning. Good morning, Washington Church. I am excited to be here worshiping with you guys today. It's just Patrick and I this morning, so that means you guys have to sing really loud for us. Um, not for us, for Jesus. I'm going to invite you to stand and join us in the call to worship. How great is our God. How awesome are your deeds. Lord, you are gracious and compassionate. You are my rock, my shield, and my fortress. Therefore, we will sing your praises and speak of your goodness. Jesus, you are worthy of all worship and praise. Reveal yourself to us.
Amen. Hey, at this time, I'm going to invite you to greet others around you and kids. Come on forward for the kids' message. All right, what we're going to do the kids' message a little different. So, if we have so few kids, if you are a kid at heart, please come join us up front. Okay, so if you're a kid at heart, please come so that we got more kids up here. Elijah, you want to come up? All right, Landon, would you like to join us? Scott Peck, you're a kid at heart, so you definitely need to sit right here. All right, any others? Is there no Patrick to this Sunday? Any other kids at heart? Anne's a kid at heart. I love that. All right. So I want to talk to you guys today about praise. Who can tell me what praise is? What is it? What is praise? Nobody. All right. We'll have some adults help us. Anybody can tell me what praise is? What's praise? Okay. Giving God the honor he deserves. Who else? Worship. Okay. Okay. Any others? Joyous noise. I like it. All right. The dictionary definition is expressing one's respect and gratitude towards something. Okay? So something that you think is worthy of respect and gratitude, giving it that. But then it also says, like, with exuberance. So, like, loudly, maybe in song. All right? The Bible says... In a few different places, actually a lot of different places, but I'm going to only list a few here. In Psalm 78, Asaph says, We will tell, of the coming, tell the coming generations the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders he has done. So that would be praise, okay? Telling the, the generations the awesome things that God has done. David says in Psalm 145, One generation commends your works to another. They tell your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And then the adults are going to learn in Luke here. So Luke says, oops, I skipped it. Luke says, and this is Mary speaking, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. Now, I asked to have extra kids up here because this is what we're going to do. Do you have that timer? All right, can you put the one-minute timer up there? I'm going to give you guys, I don't, you guys, what do I have in my hand? What is this? A microphone. Now, there's cool things you do with a microphone. Up there, they were singing with microphones, and right now I'm talking so that everybody can hear me right? And when we praise, we want to do it loud so that others can hear of the awesome things that God has done. So I'm going to give you guys each an imaginary microphone. So if Mr. Peck, if you can help me pass out an imaginary microphone to each kid. You're getting a popsicle stick, but this is what you're going to do. They're putting a one-minute timer up there. In the verses, it said over and over again, generation to generation. So these people out here should be telling other people about all of the awesome things that God has done and praising. So what I want you to do, you're going to be my reporters. You have one minute. I want you to go to as many adults as you can. Okay, we're not going to run around. But as many adults as you can. And I want you to hear from them what they are praising God for. Okay? One minute. Everybody stand up. Okay? One minute. Go. Go find out from the adults what they praise God for. And then when the minute's over, come back. You now have 30 seconds. You, 
You have 10 seconds. All right, my lovely kids, please come back and join me at the stage. All right, my amazing and wonderful and incredible reporters, who can tell me a thing that an adult praise God for? Yeah, for their family, awesome. Oh, I'm praising for a successful surgery, is that what you said? Okay, what else? Oh, forgiveness, that's a great one. All right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray. We're going to pray that God would help them, but also help us praise God so that generation to generation knows how awesome he is. Okay? Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this morning. I thank you for these kids. I thank you that you are worthy to be praised and that we could talk endlessly about all the mighty uh, things that you've done, but also the mighty and amazing things that you are. I pray, God, that we would be bold in praising you, that we'd be loud so that others can hear and know who you are and the awesomeness that you possess. God, you are worthy of praise, and I pray that we would live in a way that shows that worthiness. Help us to, help us to go and, sh and, and share, whether it's with our microphone or not, how awesome and amazing you are. And also to ask the adults around us ways that they are, are praising you for what you've done and who you are. And in your name we pray. And all God should have said, thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right, you guys may go to class. Adults, you may stand up and get back to praising him. Good morning, everybody. Good to uh, be with you. Welcome. If you're visiting with us this morning, have, we're just going to share just for a moment. Um, love how this side's sitting and this side's standing. You guys are, yeah, you can stay standing. That's fine. This is not going to take, take but a moment. Um, one of the things that was, was spoken over us by somebody um, over a year ago was that, um, that as the Lord begins to move, he's going to share with, with those who are seeking his face um, what he's going to do. And, and the example we were given of that was that the Lord was going to, it would be, I was told that it would, would be common that um, what ha would happen in our prayer room, and our prayer space, that happens before the service, that God would begin to reveal the things that he wants to do, even during the service, or that it wouldn't be uncommon that a prayer team would come in and, and they would actually share with me what came forward for them, and it would be the exact same thing I was preaching on. So just things like that. Um, so one of the things that came forward this morning um, as a word of knowledge that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12, and so I, um, Josiah is going to share that with us this morning, and then we're going to just invite those who that applies to just to go for prayer, as we have a prayer team that's going to get up and stand along, along on this side, and they're going to be over there, and so as you're listening, if the Lord kind of puts it on your heart to, to get prayer for, for this word, I would encourage you as we're worshiping to get up out of your seat and just go find somebody from the prayer team to get prayer. Yeah, so while we were in the prayer room, um, I had asked the Lord in my heart, I was like, God, what do you have for today? And I felt like he showed me this picture of this kind of flower thing, um, and it started to bloom and open up, and inside of it was uh, this big corn on a cob. And I was like, Lord, what is that? And uh, I felt like he told me, he said, it's my, for today I have uh, nourishment and sustenance. Um, and I said, Lord, what does that mean? <laughs> And I felt like he said, for the body, he has nourishment and sustenance for us. Um, and he, I, it's a little hard to describe, but I feel like he showed me this kind of image of like, a lot of us are kind of stuck in this pattern of like, we don't actually take his nourishment and his sustenance uh, until we're in starvation, right? And we hit starvation, and we're like, whoa, God, we really need you. I really need you now. Then we take his nourishment, his sustenance, right? That's experiences of his goodness and his presence. Um, and then we sit on that for a while, and then we hit the point of starvation again. But uh, I really felt like he wanted um, to get us into the pattern of, like, we, we take his presence, we take his goodness, uh, even when we're not in starvation, even when it's just like it's a normal day, and then that prevents us from ever hitting that point of, like, spiritual starvation where we're 
in these ruts or these really bad places. So, yeah, definitely the invitation is, uh, if that resonates with you, to find a prayer team and just get prayer. Thanks, Josiah. So, again, if as we are worshiping, um, the prayer team's going to be on the outskirts. They have most of them have yellow um, name tags on. And if you feel like that fits you, if you feel like you've been in a season of of coming to the Lord only in your dire need times instead of constantly, where you need encouragement this morning for this morning, or just need that bread that, that Jesus talks about, that daily bread, then I would encourage you just to go get encouraged, to go have um, the prayer team lay hands on you and pray into whatever's going on in your life. So let's stand and continue to worship the Lord. the world but it couldn't fill me a man's empty praise and treasures that fade and never enough then you came along and put me back together
If the altar's where you meet us, take me there, take me there. If you're looking for an offering, it's right here. My life is here, and I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You're a fire, the refiner. I want to be considered. I want to be tried by fire. Purify, take whatever you desire. Oh, Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried. If your glory wants to come, let it fall. We want it all. Your fire is consuming. Fill this place to set it ablaze. And I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You're a fire, the refiner.
Father, may this be more than just a song for us. May this be more than empty words. Father, may this be our heart's cry this morning. That we would have clean hands and a pure heart so that we could see you. Whatever that takes, God. Father, we're asking that you would burn the things of the world away from us. so that our hearts would be set ablaze for you. We surrender ourselves to you, to your will, to your way, whatever it looks like. Father, we just say that we trust you because we know that you are good, that you are good and faithful, Father, in every season, every circumstance, every situation. It's who you are. So we just place our lives in your hands. Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would speak to us today as your word comes forth. May our hearts be soft to hear from you. Just come and have your way in this place. We pray all these things in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. May be seated. Just a, a quick reminder before we get into the message. Um, this is the last Sunday that we are going to be collecting for PCH. So we have, uh, those of you who are visiting, we have an, um, this great long-standing relationship with an orphanage in Kenya. And each year we provide Christmas gifts for the girls in those orphanages. And that's what the ornaments on the trees are symbols of that. But um, you can give to PCH. You can go online through our website and just hit the drop-down box and just select um, the PCH option. So this is last Sunday that we're going to be taking in funds for that. So I'd encourage you to consider uh, giving for that. Um, I get to introduce our, our speaker uh, this morning as we wrap up our Advent series that we've been going through. This is our, our last Sunday of that, and then we're going to transition back to First John um, next Sunday as we, we get together. Um, but our, um, our, our speaker is quite an amazing person. He, uh, um, if you sit and, and listen to him or have a conversation, I'm going to imagine that it, preaching would be very much the similar. Um, you have to be paying close attention and you usually need to have a dictionary or a thesaurus nearby because uh, he uses un- uncommon words um, to articulate amazing things. But um, loves God, loves the Lord. Um, you know, he's a, a seminary grad. He's pastored. He's taught um, in different places. He, he's, but more than any of those things, um, he loves being a dad and he loves being a husband. Um, to his amazing wife. And so um, Dylan Murphy is going to come and share the word. So would you join me in welcoming Dylan Murphy this morning? Thanks, man. Oh, this is so fun. Um, this is cool to get to be here, uh, finishing up 2023. So I, I love, when my wife and I got to live in Denver for a while, which is, I feel like every Ohioan's dream as far as climate goes. It was as sunny as you think, it, you know, um, it, was, it was awesome. But one thing that I love there, I was at a church, it was an Anglican church. If you're not familiar with that, it's kind of like Episcopal, but they did all of the church calendar stuff. I was just getting to talk with Bob about that earlier this morning. And I, I loved it, and it, it helped me so much get ready for. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this, where, like, Christmas just kind of sneaks up and gets you. Uh, I know that, like, there's, like, the red and the green and everything, but, like, as a Christian, you're like, I guess it's Christmas. This, that's, that's a significant thing. I haven't really gotten my heart ready or my mind ready or whatever. Um, and so one kind of cool thing about having kids is in some ways you get to go around again. I don't know if any of you guys have, have sort of felt that. And it's different because you're the one cleaning up the puke as opposed to puking. Sometimes it happens all at the same time. But um, it, in getting to go around again with our kids, we've gotten to go around again with Advent. Um, and I love that, that church calendar thing. And so Jacintha found this really cool um, book, and it's, it's cardboard. It's got the thick sort of book pages in um, you pop out this little cardboard platform. It's got all these slits cut in it. And Kieran loved using his fine motor skills to punch through the slits and give us space. And then each night, um, we would put in a different, we'd read a little 
excerpt and we put it in a different figure. And so it starts out kind of flat and barren, and then you build in the, the angel and Mary and Joseph and the stable. And, and, each, and Sia, who's two, um, our daughter, she, she loved to hold it. That, that happened, I think, about halfway through. She like, got into, like, I want to hold it. So Kieran would hold the book. She'd hold that. And, um, and you know, this little scene got more and more rich, lots of jewel tones. It got populated. It looked beautiful. Um, it was really cool. And it helped us as a family um, anticipate. So for me, um, I, I actually, I love anticipating. Um, I, I enjoy it. And so uh, I know that it is after Christmas Day, but I guess you shouldn't be surprised that I still kind of want to pull us back to some adventy feelings. Um, but again, Christ is always incarnate. He's always risen. He's always with us. And so we can always be with him in his movements. And so um, for me, that, that jumps back to uh, Mary's song. If you got, like to be all high church, you can call it Mary's Magnificat, which is really just the first word in Latin, but that sounds super cool. Um, so Mary, this is, this is Mary's biggest quote um, that, she, that she has. There's loads of reasons we should pay attention to it. You could say Mary's, I was talking with Jimmy, um, I let, you put this language in my ear. She's, she's the first Christian. People have placed their faith in God before Jesus. Abraham placed his faith, David, Hannah, um, Ruth, all these people. Uh, but Mary placed her faith, faith in the incarnate Christ, you know, as his mother. And so she heard the gospel from the angel Gabriel, and now we get to hear her writing this beautiful poem, this song that is her preaching the gospel to her cousin. Uh, if you guys didn't eat Christmas family travel, travel, you know that. It's a special thing. It's not a vacation. It's a trip right? That's like, as family, you had those categories, right? It's a trip. We did a trip. We did our circuit. We did uh, Cincinnati, uh, Henderson, Akron. It was big. So, so Mary takes this trip, and I, w- I want to bring us into her getting to visit her cousin Elizabeth so we can step into this song that she gives us um, that's built in some anticipation, but some already here. So We'll click up. Um, this is in Luke, so if you if you want to be along, um, you can. Um, I'll have it all up here too. So this is uh, that that huge first chapter. That um, the context coming into this is Mary just got to hear from Gabriel. You're going to bear the Son of God. He's going to save your people. It's going to be awesome. And she believed. She has she has wonder. She doesn't understand, but she believes. And then soon after, we're not given a measure of time, but at that time. Mary gets ready, and she hurries to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she enters Zechariah's home and greeted her cousin, Elizabeth. You can go ahead to the next slide. So when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, you can keep it there for a second. So Elizabeth is Mary's cousin, and her husband also had a miracle baby prophecy given to her. Um, your, uh, but it was through her husband. Her husband is a high priest, Zechariah. He's coming in to do his job um, in the temple, and God shows up and speaks to him and tells him, you're old, but you're going to have a baby, and it's going to be a big deal. Zechariah can't quite believe it, so Gabriel says, I'm Gabriel, and you didn't listen? This is huge news. You're shut up for a while. And he actually can't talk until his son gets born. It's not so much I'm Gabriel as is in the I'm the messenger of God and you didn't receive this. So kind of slap on the wrist for Zechariah. But but Elizabeth is anticipating the birth of her son. And her son is going to help people anticipate Christ. You get that anticipation feeling like Advent, getting ready, coming. And so Mary has shown up. Jesus is with her in utero. And as he's present, things are happening, right? John in utero leaps I love that as a parent, your kid can have faith in God before they can speak. We can talk about this sometime. Holy Spirit, awesome. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit too, and she exclaims. It's normal if you're in the ancient Near East, if you're Jewish, to bless people, right? Hopefully we still do that, even if it's really abbreviated, glad you're here sort of thing, sort of set out the side of our mouth as we do whatever we're doing. But blessings, this is a Holy Spirit-filled blessing. So you can click on ahead. Uh, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord, she gets it, this is Elizabeth, should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. So Elizabeth blesses Mary um, 
I don't think there's snark in the last line, but it's hard not to like for me to read that in. <laughs> Zachariah didn't really believe, but you did. Good job. Like, I'm proud of you. You believed. You trusted. Um, and so, so she blesses Mary, and now Mary's going to respond. So the next verse, and Mary said, I want to back up for a second. Mary was traveling over to get to see her cousin Elizabeth. Um, we got to do a lot of traveling this Christmas. One thing I love about it, a friend once called it windshield time. This is that the kids are in the back, and if they're not, like, blowing up, you can actually have these conversations, talk. Um, at one point, everybody except for me driving was asleep for, like, an hour. I just got to kind of think. And you notice those, those moments are kind of special moments when you actually get to, to pull back a little bit and, and have the space to not have to think, which enables you to think more about things that might matter, or at least things that are rattling around on your head. I think as she was headed over here, she was reflecting. We're told later that in the events of Jesus' boyhood, that Mary gathered up all these things and meditated on them. It's, you could say it's her personality. You could say it's her practice. This is, she's reflective. And so she, in the Holy Spirit as well, this is a special moment, is going to speak some, some incredible words. And so we're brought into Mary's song. And she starts out, My soul glorifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. So right off the bat, this is poetry. I taught English. I love it. Um, and so th these first lines, you could, she could have done with one line, but she's got to spill over. This is, these two lines are parallel. Her soul, her whole self is making much of God. Her spirit is rejoicing. This is a good, glad praising of God. So Mary starts out by worshiping and praising God. Elizabeth goes, Mary, you're incredible. And she is honoring God. And Mary goes, God is incredible. He, he's, he's amazing. He's met me. He's seen me. We'll get into all that. But right now, she starts off with, he is, he's amazing. God, my Savior, right off the bat. Mary's preaching the gospel. This isn't just a nice poem. These are some nice thoughts. Mary has heard the good news from Gabriel, and that is what is recapitulating out of her. She is, she's, she's, she's bringing that good news and, and re-saying it. My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. His servant here would be whom? Yeah, yeah, herself. Just, just so we can fill that. So he has been mindful of my humble state. So question why is Mary joyful? Why, she have, why does she have abundant joy right now? Well, on, on one hand, it's because she's a faithful Jew. Her people have been living under Rome, not in control of their own situation. There's not a big middle class either. Most everybody's poor. Some people are rich. She's not rich. She's, in, she's, she's a faithful Jew waiting for God to come save his people. And so part of her joy is the Savior is here for me and for my people. Let's radiate out. I have been included especially in his joy. God doesn't just do thing, good things to us. He does wonderful things with us, right? He, he, he raises us up and sticks with us and goes and makes beautiful things. He doesn't just say watch. He says come along, right? Um, so not only is she a faithful Jew, and this is great, she has a humble estate. She's not rich. Her situation is low. And this is interesting because this actually takes faith for her to be able to say. If you were to take a worldly look at Mary's situation, it was actually worsened by the angel's news. You're, you're poor. That's staying the same. God's not giving you money. Um, I mean, the kings will come to bring some gifts. She's not expecting that. Um, but now your husband and your relationship might be a little strained because you have a baby not with him. He's going to have to trust God all the time, all the time that that was the case. And uh, something that is biologically unprecedented uh, and will also never happen again is happening to you. Um, we have names for people that say that that's the case. They're not kind names. Um, so Mary socially has just put it, been put in the spot of everybody's going to be suspicious of you. Sure, you've got the son of God that happened to show up to you before you were married. A plus B equals, right? 
So, so from, from a worldly vision, Mary's situation is actually worse via the best news in the world, right? Um, but she's able to receive it in faith. Um, it's easy to stop the conversation there, like, go have faith, receive the good things of God. We've got to dig down and say, like, how? How was she able to do that? Because if, if we want to be able to receive God's good news as good news, um, we need faith to be enfleshed a little bit for us. What do, what do we mean by that? How did she do that? So if you are a Jewish person and you get to hear Mary's song, you don't go, that's super cool and super new. You actually go, I've heard that before. A thousand years ago, for Mary, a thousand years before, there was a woman named Hannah. She had um, a husband who also had another wife who had enough kids and she had none. Her life was bitter. Her life was low. She was praying. She was praying so passionately that the priest there thought she was drunk and kind of chided her. She's like, no, I just want God's help. And God helps her. And now she's pregnant with a child. And Hannah has this song. It's like the same thing. Um, you don't need to go to like a fancy commentary to find that. Everybody's talking about it. But when I showed up to try to learn about this, everybody said, hey, go, go and read what Hannah said. And it's the same stuff. My soul glorifies God. My soul magnifies him. Um, we're going to continue on. But the sort of themes you'll get is those who are low, God picked up. And those who are high, God knocked down. Hannah kind of is like giving a raspberry to her sister wife because now she finally has kids. Um, so there, there's like this switcheroo um, that's happening, and Hannah is talking about that. Let me go back to my question. How was Mary able to receive Gabriel's good news in faith? It's not because she knew the scripture. It's because she had received the scripture, God's word, as if it was her story, and as if God would do the same sorts of things for her, right? My brain naturally catalogs a lot of information. That does not necessarily do me any good with my walk with God. Can that information be my story? Can I expect that God would, would be the same way for me? I don't know if you guys have ever done this where... Um, I think we actually, it may have even been a few weeks ago, where there's some verse and we take out like you or he or she and we put in your name. And it might be one verse, it might be a whole paragraph, like the beginning of Ephesians. Or um, maybe there's a Bible character that like you can pop yourself into their shoes, either in their like brokenness or their having been savedness, or even in their pride or you know, whatever. And when you put yourself in there, you feel like known and accepted and seen by God and you also can receive the things that he's doing for that person as if they're for you. Like, ah, these things are for me. That's the difference between being able to just hear God's word and have it kind of scatter on the ground versus push down into the dirt, Jesus' parable, right? So Mary has been doing this. I don't think she just used um, Hannah's song because she's bad at poetry and needed like a framework, like I might give my freshman. Um, I think this is because she believed that Hannah-ish things could happen to her. Because she's part of the people of God. She's dwelt on God's word as if it's for her. Also, as we go through, Mary's what we would call in modern world plagiarizing. I, I would prefer to use the word inspired. Almost everything she says is actually direct quotations from the Psalms. Her song is going to be about 10 verses. She's got about 10 or so references from the Psalms. This isn't original material, but this is Mary's Magnificat. This is the song of the gospel coming to the mother of God. Come on. And it's, and it's beautiful because, again, how, how is Mary able to receive the angel's message, Gabriel's message to her in faith? Because she believed that she was in God's story. She, could, she was one of God's people. Hannah-ish things could happen to her. And she had been nourishing her heart and mind in the prayer book of God's people. That's the Psalms. Psalms is how Jews learn to pray. Psalms is how Christians learn to pray. Psalms is how God's people learn to pray. It's not just one of the books. No book is just one of the books in the Bible. They have, they have a location, and Psalms is at the heart and mind juxtaposition of life with God. 
Mary didn't just make up her prayer, and that is not knocking making up prayers. Pray to God what is on your heart. Bring yourself to him in faith. Absolutely. These aren't things at odds. But what Mary is doing here is she is having a spilling over of her life with God in the language of God's people. Um, I've had friends walk away from Jesus, and I have no idea why, and it would be ridiculous and prideful for me to say I know why. But a thought that comes to my mind is sometimes, again, this is not meant to be explanatory, a thought that comes to my mind is if it was because they didn't hear God, have they heard God's people not hearing God? There's a lot of psalms of God, where are you? God, where are you? We're, we're actually given ways to practice experiences of emptiness. Mary has probably practiced those experiences. When we practice God's language in the Psalms of emptiness, expressing that to him, guess what? As that capacity deepens, it's a, it's a bi-directional thing. It's not just that we're deepening in our ability to be sad and empty and pained with God, we're also lifting, the, the roof is being lifted, the ceiling is being lifted, so that she can say, my soul glorifies with God. Our capacity to rejoice in God is related to our capacity to share all of life with him. So how is Mary able to receive the message of Gabriel in faith? She believes she's one of God's people. She knows that God can do those things for her. She's heard the stories and received them as for her, and she is related to God through his language he has given her. Here's an invitation for us. We can fill our hearts with God's word as a way to prepare for the joy of faith. We can fill our hearts and minds with God's word, not merely as an obligation, not merely as a practice, not merely as an intellectual exercise, not merely as something that I should know as a Christian, but as a way to actually prepare, even in our lowest state, to be able to be joyful. We are not, by default, able to receive any joy. There, is a, there's a, there are practices that actually make us more like coiled mousetraps to be able to receive joy. We can do that. Um, so Mary's done that, and it's awesome, because she gets to say this song. And she continues... Um, into the other half of verse 48. She says, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. For me, I, I see um, this kind of out in, big, small sort of oscillation. Um, all generations, for the rest of time, they'll call me, me blessed. The mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. You feel like that's sort of out and in. Uh, the thing that came to mind is um, I have a distinct love of walking beneath really, really tall trees. Um, I, I don't think it's unnatural. I th I'm sure some of you are like, yes, that's, I love it. And there's a lot of reasons to love it. One of the reasons that I think I love it, if I'm going to try to like dissect it, is I like feeling my smallness in certain ways. Not always. People can make you feel small, and that's crappy. Like, I don't like that. Um, but to be near a redwood makes me feel like I'm not running this whole thing. I, it's been here for a long time. It'll keep being here for a long time. You know, whatever's going on in my life is going to be there. But, but it's not as if I don't matter. It's as if the bigness is a stilling thing to me. Um, if you want another angle in this, this could be like you have a celebrity that you think is awesome and you've spent so much time and they finally like touch your hand. And you're like, oh my gosh, you know, th that's also going on here. There's also that type of exuberance. It's the stillness that comes by being near a big tree. And it's also the oh my goodness moment um, that Mary's having. God in his hugeness has seen me. And that also goes into her seeing that God in his hugeness has seen all of his people throughout time. I get to, get to participate in that. I want to use kind of a, a modern word here. Um, I don't know if Mary would use it. 
But I think Mary feels seen. I think she feels seen. Um, you know, we kind of joke around sometimes like, oh, I feel really seen by that comment when someone like makes a dig and it really gets you. You're like, ah, that's me. <laughs> Don't call me out like that. Uh, th- this is the scene of I feel acknowledged, deeply known, deeply loved. Uh, I think this isn't biblical interpretation. This is just sort of hack psychology. Um, I think that the most fundamental parts of our identity, uh, as, as it's been formed across our lives, um, tend, maybe I won't be, I won't be exhaustive, they tend to relate to being seen or not seen. This will, this will be pretty easy, right? Okay, so here's, here's two sides of the coin for being unseen. Some of our deepest wounds have come from being not seen, being ignored, passed over, invalidated, treated as, as insignificant, even not even occurring to the people that one feels like they should occur to. Those are deep wounds, having not been seen. Here's the other side of that, that, that hard coin, being seen deeply and meaningfully and rejected, right? Those are, someone actually knows you and they call you out in some way and it actually like hits home. You know, if someone said to me like, you'll never be a linebacker, I'd be like, exactly. <laughs> it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't stick. But there are, there are these moments where actually someone has seen you and they've cast you aside and you can't cast that aside. Right, it just like has magneted and been welded onto your soul, right? And God does incredible works in pulling that off and even flipping that. Oppositely, and these sometimes are harder to think of because we lived in a broken world, but some of the, the most significant identities that you have and encouragements are when you have been seen and you've been loved. It's not the same as a compliment, just like a, an idle one. I mean, positivity is nice, I'm talking about the thing that actually reaches all the way into the heart of yourself and someone sees it and says, that is good, you are good, right? That's what God's doing for Mary. She's able to receive it as that because she loves him and she has the the language and the faith and the, she's able to, in her humility, she's able to actually be seen by God for, for it to lift her up. Um, for us, there's an invitation to go with Mary and to realize God sees you in your low estate. He does. There weren't moments when you went into so dark of a closet of discouragement that he wasn't there with you. He just, he sees. And not just in like a judging, incisive, like LASIK seeing, like a, a loving present understanding, seeing. All of his goodness, all of his hugeness, all of his wonder is still there with him and is loving as he sees you. Uh, I wrote this little statement that to me feels a little bit of the heart of Mary's. Um, well, I, I won't say it's the heart of her song, but it, it's, it's a heart in her song. The brokenness and smallness of your worldly life, let's say our, the brokenness and smallness of our worldly lives are the primary spaces where God will see, help, and bless you. This is the gospel of Jesus. Thanks be to God. Amen. Right? The brokenness and smallness of your worldly life is the primary space where God will see, help, and bless you. This is the gospel in Jesus Christ. This is what she's experiencing. It's awesome. And, and she's going to preach it to us. She's, she's teaching us in her life how to get to do that. Um, so if I'm going to introduce someone new, transition, if I'm going to introduce someone new uh, to someone that I know, uh, this t- tends to be my pattern a bit. Um, I'll say the person's name, something about them, and then how I know that thing about them. So I don't know if John reads here or not. Um, So if I were to introduce John Reed, I'd say, hey, this is John. He's incredibly welcoming. When my wife and I came here for the first time, he made us feel like 
we belonged, that he wanted to have us around, and guess what? He actually talked to me the next week, right? Like, that's John. He's, in, he's welcoming, he's sincere, he's thoughtful. Um, this is Todd Taylor. He, his heart is soft to the movement of God. When you were talking about God providing for us to have a new roof, you were brought to tears. I don't think it's because you have a deep love of roofs. I mean, they're nice, but it's because in that, you felt God's movement and your heart was soft to that. Todd Taylor. This is, a, it, it's cool to do this, right? Like, and we can do, we don't always have to be like super deep or, or weird about it, like we're sewing someone's laundry or whatever, but like, um, but this is the way we can introduce each other. This is, this is the person, this is a description, and this is how I know that about them. That's what Mary's doing for God here. Um, she, she says his, his name, holy is his name, and then she's going to give us a description of God, and then she's going to show us how we see that. So like name, description, and then actions, how we, how we see him being that way. So I, I, I carried over that verse, holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. So God is holy, that's his name. And then we get these two words. It's nice that in English, they happen to both start with M, that's convenient. That wasn't the plan in the original language, but his mercy extends to those who fear him. So God is merciful, and he has performed mighty deeds. He's holy. When we hear the word holy, we should hear things like special, set apart, above, excellent, unique. Okay? But I want to I really lean in to these two. His mercy extends to those who fear him. That word mercy in Bible translation using Greek, Hebrew, is often related to this beautiful Hebrew word has said, God's faithfulness to stick with you in love. He, he will stick with you in his love. His love has a, a, a continual, committed, um, blood family love in the perfect sense. So his mercy, his, his love stays with you. He will have this staying with you, merciful love. And... He's performed mighty deeds with his arm. You hear that? So again, Mary's like filled with Old Testament language because she's been reflecting on it. When you hear his arm um, in the Old Testament, what comes to mind? Like, does anybody like go like, oh yeah, arms always mean this in, in the Bible? That somebody knows. Yes, it's power. It's often military power. Kings have arms. Everybody has arms. Kings have arms. Um, like, this is like, think like arms race. Sure, we can use a modern synonym, right? That arms. God has this mighty arm over and against those who would put his people in a bad situation that would make them continue to especially need his mercy, right? So God has mercy, the sticking with love, and he is mighty over and against those who are unjust, um, those who have power and are using it in the default human way. His arm is stronger. So this is God. Holy is his name. She's, she's, she's calling out. He has mercy. She feels that. She's participating in that. And God's performed mighty deeds with his arm. Now she's going to give us some of God's actions. So let's click forward here. Um, again, this is straight from the Psalms. She's, she's say, she, is now, she is now experiencing firsthand what she believes has always been the case, but now it's for her, it's in a new way. God has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he sent the rich away empty. Color-coded them, that may or may not be helpful for you. Um... Blue, God's mercy. These all include God's mercy. But there's the humble and the hungry. And what's God doing with them? He's lifting them up. He's filling them. Again, keep yourself in this. Like, don't let it shift to information. If you are hungry, if you are humble in some way, you, you, you feel the, the lowness, the weakness of your life in some way, 
So for you, he's lifted you up. He has filled you. These are the things he'll do. He's scattered the proud. He's brought down rulers. And he set the rich away empty. This is the type of thing that God does all the time. And the Lord is faithful in like his, his words and, and mighty in all his works, and he delights in everything that he does. So I kind of, I kind of reorganize these to put them into groups, right? So God scattered, brought down, sent away the first group he's talking about here, the proud, the rich, the rulers. Those are, those are, those are being brought down. And God has lifted up um, the humble, filled the hungry. He's brought them up. Reversal. God's doing this, this switching thing. And you only get to do that if you have the power, right? If you're at the bottom of the food chain and you've got nothing, you wish it were flipped, but it can't be. Or, here's the thing, if you have a revolution and you flip it, guess what? You just become the proud and the rich and the rulers anyways. You, you can only do this if you have real and absolute and good power. Right? This, is, this is God. This is who he is. So you could put a, like a, a heading. I don't have it, but you could, you could say reversal. Switching. In your lowness, God sees you. And he desires to lift you up. And he is able to do it, and he delights in doing that. This is, this is his calling card, right? Um, you call him for these things. He wants to be called for these things. If he had limited power, he would get annoyed that you wanted him to do a lot of work. Right? That would tire him out. That's not, that's not like the rules we're playing with. His power is bottomless, so what could he do but delight in using it? at good things. As parents, we get tired when our kids want us to love them sometimes because we have limited energy and we wish we didn't and we try to trust God to give us more. God doesn't ever get tired by us needing him to love us. He delights in us actually realizing that that's the case, right? So God does this. Um, and this is always what he's done, but I, I want us to like be in touch with the fact that we don't actually expect this. Um, I grew up, you know, private Christian home. That was a gift to me. That was a blessing. But some things get familiar, and it's hard to realize that I don't actually think it's true. So let, let me put a verse that you may have heard before. This is the next one. Um, Jesus says, the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. In the kingdom of God, this is how it goes. But this is not what we believe in, in regular life, right? The weakest, most poorly coached team will, the last will be last. Um, if, do we expect someone homeless on the streets to run a successful business and have a flourishing family in five years? The last will be last. We don't expect this. We don't. And this is not the way that things naturally happen in the course of the power of the world. They don't. So, like, let's put ourselves back in touch with the fact that, that this is revolutionary. We don't expect this. When we look at winners, we expect to see more winning. And we might not like it, but that's what we expect. When we look at people that the world defines as losing, we expect more of the same. We, we truly do. But this isn't just how we expect the world to work. This is also how we expect faith to work. So here's another conversation with Jesus. The disciples see a blind man, and they ask this interesting question. Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Who's the loser that made him lose? The first question sort of makes sense if you kind of have like a karma-ish view of things, like his parents did wrong things, so he's got to deal with it, and they've got to be sad because he's blind because they're bad. But they even ask the nonsense question. Was this man sinning in utero? Or was this man going to sin so bad that God had to pre-curse him? Like, they, they are stepping outside of being rational because of how entrenched this view of the world is in us. This is what we think naturally. This is what we think religiously. This is not what God tells us about how he is as a person. This happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Pick up your train. Different tracks. Right? Right? The disciples are, are over here. First, first, last, last, first, first, last, last. God's glory. 
to reverse. This lowness was allowed so that he could be raised up. And so he could delight in that and receive it in joy so that God could be glorified that comes together. That's beautiful. That's what he does. That's what Mary is, is enjoying and rejoicing in, that God does this sorts of thing. Um, the brokenness and smallness of your worldly life is the primary space where God will see, help, and bless you. This is the gospel in Jesus. This is how he has brought us in, um, in our smallness. He's brought us in through our smallness. He's brought us in through our brokenness. Um, go ahead to the next verse. This is another thing from Jesus. So, so we're, we're exploring Mary's song through the words of her son. Makes sense. Jesus says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. As a very philosophically minded young person, I didn't like this verse. Who are all these righteous people that God isn't saving? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? Like, who are all these healthy people, untainted by the scourge of sin, that are walking around as saints? They don't exist. Like, Jesus did not have, like, a theological lapse for a minute, where he's like, there's a bunch of great people that don't need me. So what's he saying, then? Let me put some, some of those colors on. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I haven't come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Can God save you if you don't need to be saved? But you do need to be saved. We can have more or less access to God's saving because of our situation in life. That sounds really weird. We can have more or less access to God's saving because of our situation in life. He's gracious, he does work, but let me show you what, what, what I mean by that. Like, here's the next verse. Jesus says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. He's talking with a rich young ruler. The man said, I, I, I want to get eternal life. And Jesus said, have you done all the right things? He said, I've done all the right things. Guy's rich and he's done all the right things. Gosh, let him in. Jesus says, you've got to sell everything that you have. Um, give it to the poor and then you can follow me. I used to think of that as Jesus saying, here is an even more difficult moral accomplishment that you need to go do. You've been really good, be incredible. And, and because I'm rich, I wonder what I need to do with that. If you are rich, you should wonder. And you're all decently clothed, so you should probably wonder, right? Um, but what if Jesus was actually telling the rich young ruler how to get to him? What if Jesus actually wanted this rich young ruler to be able to follow him? Let me give you a way that you can access your lowness so you can finally feel that you need me and then come on in. You're too rich. You can't, you can't get how much you need me. Does the rich young ruler need Jesus to save him? Entirely and no less than anybody, but he can't see it very well. Mary was ready to see it. She was low. She had walked with God and believed that he moves to help the lowly, and she was able to receive it. Jesus' most famous sermon, here you go. This is on the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God has brought us who are low, who are needy in, and he's placed us right in the courtyard of the castle. We're with him in his kingdom, belonging, and there's blessing. It's not just that he takes the high and makes them low to make justice. It's not just that he sees those who are low, and that's neat. He actually sees and blesses. 
he actually sees and raises us up. If you love Psalm 23, he does this sort of stuff. Like, he puts us with still water. He puts us in flourishing places. So don't, don't mishear this and say, ah, my life is really good. I, I might be out of touch with God. Your life might be going really, really well because God is lifting you up and is blessing you. Enjoy that with him. Mary's enjoying it. She's saying, praise God. He's done this lifting work. And so there are multiple places where we can be in our life situation and in our faith that help us to know God has come down to earth right with us. And he brings us up to be with him. And man, to be with him is where there are all riches and there's all goodness and there's perfect peace and there's true rest and it doesn't end. You don't get to stay poor in the new heavens and new earth. You walk on gold, right? Um, God does these sorts of things. Jesus said, I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the poor in spirit. I'm here for you. And that's, that's really what I think drew my heart to Mary's song is that you can't climb up to God. And gosh, is it exhausting to think you have to. It is. Jesus came down to be with us. And he came down with us. And if you, if there is, if there is lowness in your life, it might actually be the blindness that God allowed you to have so that you can enjoy the glory of him opening your eyes. And there are things you can do. No, you can't suddenly change your situation. No, you can't climb up to God, but you can be with him. Think of the Psalms. Think of how God has given us language to actually be near him in emptiness and in fullness. So here's, here's where Mary lands. He has helped his servant Israel remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. She stays with Elizabeth for a little while and then goes back home. Mary ends thinking about her people, the us that she's part of. God's remembered me and he's remembered us. Like Washington, there's a place for for us here. Um, God has remembered us. Um, and you might wonder, well, that's about Israel. The descendants of Abraham are actually descended by faith. So we get that in Hebrews and elsewhere. So if you, if you trust in God, that's actually what makes you a true child of Abraham. This is for us. This is for you. You're not just looking in through a window at something good and Jewish. You're looking in through a window at something that comes from God's people and includes us and his people. Right? He's brought us in. And he's helped. He helps. He sees, he knows, he helps right where you are. He delights in doing that. And he gives you that as your story. I want to read Mary's song from top to bottom because I'm an English teacher. And um, it's really a bummer when you break things up, you don't get to hear them all together. So here it is. Um, You can put yourself in this. Please do. Um, this is, this is our story. This is our song. Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for he's been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He's brought down rulers from their thrones, but he's lifted up the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things, but he's sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Could I pray for you? We'll sing another song in response. Lord, for those of us who feel very in touch um, with our not-wellness, um, our pain, our smallness, our failure, our inadequacy, our emptiness, our aloneness, our unseenness, 
our neediness. Lord, you meet us like you've met Mary. You bring hope that, that transforms our hearts and you make us ready for joy. Lord, would you guide us um, into, into places of sharing our whole selves where we are with you? Would you put us in touch with our sickness and with our poverty um, if our comfort and control has gotten us out of touch with that? Um, would you be gentle with us in our sickness and poverty if we are we feel way too in touch with that. But you're kind and you see and you lift. Lord, in your, in your lowering and your lifting work, we know that all of it for your people is to bring us near to you and to make us well. But Lord, as, as we think about this new year, would you begin us in a place of knowing that your good news is that you came all the way down to bring us up with you us blessed you will bless us to be a blessing Lord we open our hands we receive from you that you're here that you're good that you see us Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord, late in time behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb, veiled in flesh the
as we were singing about um, being living sacrifices and um, us burning for the Lord, which to me is always like a really powerful song that we sing. It's like, how can we sing that and really mean that? But um, I hope, I think a lot of you know the story of Elijah when he's on the mountaintop and um, showing God's power and has the sacrifice and he pours buckets and buckets and buckets of water and digs a trench and the water fills up the trench and it's like how in the world is this gonna burn how can god do that but i just felt like buckets and buckets of water um, pouring down um, and um, on me i'm sitting on this altar right but i feel like this is for everyone um just that you might sit there and think how how can he use me how could he um, bring down fire from heaven and burn me up and use me even when I'm soaked Um, but he can and he did it and we get to look back at um, what God did in the Bible and believe that he can do it for us he did it for Mary And um, yeah, just uh, kind of close your eyes with me and imagine that all the sin, all the things in our lives that might make you think uh, you can't burn, you can't be used, um, but he, he can and he will and he's done it before and he'll do it again. of this wonderful thing we were talking about that's that God has yet to bless anyone in somewhere where they are not God has yet to bless anyone in somewhere they are not and he will bless you where you are that's the only place he does the only place he can the place he delights to Lord bless us with your presence lead us in your way guide us with your light enable us to delight in being your light as you walk with you to the glory of your name and the eternal rest of your kingdom amen go in peace